thank you guys for the round of applause, even though I haven't said anything yet. But um, so my name is Omar Abdul Fattah, and I am a history student here at UBC, hoping to become a teacher. And today I would like to talk about uh, a very contentious topic, but it's something I think is very worth, worth discuss discussing, sorry. and that is the relationship between logic, science, and faith. And specifically, I'd like to challenge the idea that science, logic, and faith are inherently distinct. And, and I, I'd like to do that by sharing my story of how I became a more practicing Muslim. So I'd like to begin today by asking each and every single one of you guys, or each and every single one of you, um, what do you believe? And by this I don't mean I believe like reading break was way too short, we need two weeks. I mean, what do you believe about like your existence, like how you came to be? Uh, and me and my experiences growing up in BC for the most part, I, I think it would be safe to say that this is something a lot of us have maybe thought about, right, growing up. Maybe some of us have parents who are well involved in religious institutions. So this is something we've probably thought about. And if it's something you haven't thought about, I ask you to think about it right now. So take one second to think about what do you, what do you believe? And now I'd like to follow this up with another question. Why do you believe it? Now, for some of us, this question might throw us off because whenever you ask somebody why, you're assuming that there's some sort of logic or scientific reasoning behind the question. And this, to me, this surprise, if you will, highlights the common misconception that we have in our society today that religion and science and logic are inherently distinct. And I would like to challenge that today by sharing my story, like I said, of how I became a practicing Muslim. So you might see me standing up here with my beard and my hat, I assure you, this is not what is on the ISIS flag, so I'm not repping ISIS, I guarantee you. Um, but for me, I didn't always go around repping my religion like this. And if, if you don't believe me, here is, here is one of the first videos I did for my YouTube channel. And uh, if you're wondering why it's in Japanese, I'll explain in just a second. But, um, <laughs> so, so anyways, you can see the slow, you know, progression of the beard there, and, and you know, at one point wearing the cap. It didn't just happen overnight. This was a very intellectual, it was a long intellectual, spiritual struggle. And so, basically, now to the Japanese part. So two years ago, I had the opportunity to work in Japan, and I got a job teaching English. And this job was kind of like an open placement. So I applied for the program, but they could put me anywhere in Japan. And so I ended up on this island. So this island is beautiful, yes. Um, I slightly edited it, just a little bit. But um, this entire island is actually smaller than Stanley Park. So I went to live on this island. If you're wondering where this island is, this is Japan, you guys know, and, and this is my island down there in, in Okinawa. <laughs> yeah, Okinawa Prefecture. So you can imagine a foreigner like myself being born and raised in, in the lower mainland, New Westminster for the most part, uh, going to an island like this with a population of 390 people, according to, to City Hall, um, going to an island like this, it was uh, a huge shock for me. I didn't speak Japanese at all. I didn't even know how to cook or do laundry on my own. This was a huge transition for me. And it was also a huge transition for the people on the island. So when they see someone who's like six foot three, and you know, one thing I often heard was like, oh, ga takai desu ne. Like, <laughs> you're like, your height is really tall, basically. That's one thing I heard. So obviously stood out. Um, but surprisingly, there was one other person on the island who was almost my height. But his height earned him a special name. They called him Jumbo-san. And san means like the honorific term. Anyways, so me and Jumbo-san, basically. Um, <laughs> so I go onto this island, and you can imagine I'm feeling pretty much like a superstar. Everyone's inviting me to their house. To the, to, I, I get regularly inv invited to the three bars on the island. And, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. But eventually, all that fades, and I get used to the routine. So I'm going to school, I'm teaching English, and then I come back home, and I'm just getting used to the routine. And I'm like, really, what is the point of, of life anymore? And it wasn't really a depressive thought at first, but it was just like, you know, I've just gotten so used to it, like, what am I living for at this, at this time? And everything that made me comfortable was kind of taken away from me. So I had my language, for one. I, I couldn't speak Japanese when I first came there. That was gone. I had my friends, that was all gone. My parents, that was gone. My school, you know, school was a huge source of confidence for me. That was gone because I was graduated. I graduated at the time. So I found myself really getting used to the routine. And for me, this meant sinking into my own thoughts a lot. 
And the one thing that I had to hang on to was my faith. That was the one thing I had to hang on to. So I remember in prayer, like really for the first time in my life, thinking about my religion. Right? I, was always, I was always a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But this was the first time in my life I was thinking about my religion. So I'd be praying and I started actually crying. And I, because I would start to think about what I was actually saying in my prayer. But when you put all your baskets in, or when you put all your money, let's say, or all your eggs in one basket, then you really have to make sure that what you invested in is true. Right? It's like investing all your money in Bitcoin, and then you lose your job, and you're like, what is Bitcoin? I have no idea. <laughs> right? So I started for the first time in my life. I was like, I need to make sure that my religion is true. I, I don't want to just do this because my parents are doing this. Right? I don't want to blindly follow my, what my parents are following. So I started a scientific experiment, you could say. And it started with this claim. So one of the reasons Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God, it's not man-made, is because the book has no contradictions in it. Or that was the claim. So instead of accepting this blindly, I decided to actually do a scientific experiment. And I should just mention that this claim is actually founded in the Quran. It's an argument that comes from within the Quran. So for example, verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 says, هذا الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين. This is a book about which there is no doubt, guidance for those who are God conscious. And in chapter 4, verse 82, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مَنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If this book was from any other than God, there would have been within it many contradictions. So this is a claim that comes from within the Quran. So I thought in my head, I was like, if there are contradictions in the Quran, surely the internet would have them. So I started searching online. And this is one example of an apparent contradiction that I came across. This is one of the first ones. So I don't want to prejudice your opinions in any way. So I'm just going to put these verses out here and then you can decide if it's a contradiction or not. So this is the first verse. Take a second to read it. Here's the second verse. Here's the, here's the third verse. Okay, is this a contradiction? Now, I really thought about this, and objectively, scientifically, empirically, this is not a contradiction. Why? Because it is not an indication of how many angels were present. Rather, it is a set of successive promises. So it's just a set of successive promises. So that was one of the apparent contradictions that I came across. Here's another one. How many days? In Islam, we believe that time is relative, so our days are shorter than God's days. And this is based on this verse which says that God's day is basically 1,000 days of which we count. So this is one verse. Here is the other one. Is this a contradiction? If you read the second verse, it's actually talking about the day of judgment, which we believe is going to be so hard on people that it's going to feel like basically 50,000 years. The second verse isn't actually talking about a day of God. It's talking about the day of judgment. And I don't want anybody to blindly accept what I'm telling you. If you kind of doubt what I'm saying, go and look up the verses yourself, like here are the references, chapter 70, verse 4. So that was the first part of my scientific inquiry. I'll just go back to that. Yeah, that was the first part of my scientific inquiry. And what I basically did here was I took a claim that validated my religion and I tested it. I empirically tested it. That was one claim. That's one of the reasons why I believe, we, we believe that the Quran is the word of God. But that's not the only reason. Here's another reason. There are no scientific errors in the Qur'an. One belief that we have in Islam is that the Qur'an not only is consistent with science, but it supersedes science, it precedes science. Because some of the things that are mentioned in the Qur'an 1400 years ago have only been discovered recently. So I decided to actually test this out for myself instead of blindly accept it. So this is one example of a scientific miracle, you could say, in the Qur'an. Um, it is he who has made the sun a shining light and the moon a derived light. So I want to focus your attention on these two underlying terms. I had no idea that the sun is its own light and the moon is actually a reflected light. I had no idea whatsoever. Um, so when I discovered this, this really boggled my mind. And just to clarify one thing, um, no, this is actually not in this verse, it's in the next verse. But So in this specific verse, there are two words used to describe the different lights of the moon and the sun. The word for the sun is siraj, which is like, a torch, if you will. And the word for the moon is nur, which is like the, the light reflected on the wall, the reflected light. So I found this to be pretty amazing. That was one example. Here's another one. 
There are elements of the Big Bang theory that are present in the Quran. So here's an example. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَ تَرَطْقًا فَفَطَقْنَاهُمَا Have those who disbelieve not considered that the heavens and the earth, and by heavens it means galaxies, were once a joint entity, and then we separated them. So we discovered in 1929 with Edwin Hubble's observations that the universe was actually expanding. And basically what he, what he observed is that planets, or stars actually, are actually, they're going away from each other at a pretty rapid rate. So this is one of the reasons why we believe that the heavens and the earth, or the galaxies and the earth, were once closer together than they are now. And the whole idea of expansion is presented in this next verse. And we are its expander. So this is, was mentioned 1400 years ago, and it was only confirmed by Edwin Hubble in 1929. So for me, it wasn't so much amazing that this was consistent with the Quran, but what was amazing to me was that there wasn't a single verse that I came across in the Quran that was inconsistent with science. And to me, what this means to me is that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not write this book. Like logically, I thought about this when I was analyzing this. People say he wrote the book. But I thought, you know what, I had no idea that the moon was a reflected light, or I had no idea that you know, the universe was expanding, but how did he know? And he lived 1400 years ago when there wasn't Google. You know, he couldn't just Google things. So that was the second part of my scientific experiment. Then I realized, okay, I was like, okay, this makes sense. What I was taught as a kid wasn't just lies. I validated it. I looked at it, my, I looked at it myself. But what about evolution, right? Isn't that another thing that completely contradicts everything that I've learned as a Muslim? What about evolution? And so I began to study evolution. And here's what I realized about evolution. Whether you accept evolution, or if I, if I were to accept evolution and every single thing that it states, that doesn't justify me beco becoming an atheist, or it doesn't justify me being an agnostic. Why? Because the theory of evolution in and of itself doesn't explain the origins of the universe. And I would argue further that it doesn't really explain the origins of the first organism, because every discourse on evolution assumes that things can reproduce. So a question that I had in my head was, okay, I was like, take me back to the first organism. How did it even get the ability to reproduce? And even if you accept that, you still have to explain the, you know, the origins of the universe. So that was one thing I realized about evolution. The second thing I realized was whether I choose to devote my life to Islam or whether I take a more agnostic, secular route, either way, I'm being involved in blind faith. Right? Many religious people, they blindly take the followings of their scholars. Just like many people who believe in science blindly accept what their textbook tells them or what you know, their scientists tell them. Right? I mean, for, take for example the idea of evolution. How many people who believe in evolution have ever actually studied the archeo archaeological record themselves? Or how many have actually looked at the journal articles themselves, even though it's free to do with UBC Library website, right? So few people do this. And so ultimately, the point is here that what I'm trying to get at is my journey to faith really was an intellectual process. It didn't just something, I didn't just have a vision one night and I'm like, yes, Allahu Akbar, you know? It really was, it really was a slow intellectual process. And it still, in a way, is. For me, the reason why I get up every morning before sunrise to pray is for this reason, because I believe this is the truth intellectually, logically, and spiritually. And so, what can any of you guys, or any of you take away from this? Right, you guys have heard a lot of amazing TED Talks today, and, but I don't believe in knowledge without application. Right? You should listen to something and you should actually implement it in your life. So I'd like to leave us all with one verse from the Quran. And this verse is presented in the context of a theological debate, but it's still something that I try to live my life with every, every day. It's still something I try to live my life by. So the verse is, قُلْ هَاتُ بُرْحَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Present your evidence if you are truthful. Okay? And so my message today is, no matter what you're exposed to, always ask questions, always critically think, always seek evidence, always ask for evidence. So if somebody comes today to you or tomorrow and says, you know, Justin Trudeau just abolished taxes. Don't just blindly accept them. Don't rip up your T4, right? Hang on to it, right? Always ask questions. Where'd you get that information from, right? Ask questions. There's nothing wrong with that. And so when we do this, we make ourselves less susceptible to believing in things that 
fuel or drive so much of the oppression that we see in the world today, the racism, the Islamophobia, the sexism. All these negative things are fueled by ignorance. And that's because people don't ask questions. They blindly accept things, and they don't seek out evidence. So think, be critical, and just seek out the truth. Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could just mention something briefly, uh, next week we're having, starting Monday, we're having our annual uh, Muslim Students Association Islam Awareness Week. So if, uh, if you guys have questions about Islam or just want to come and eat halal food, then please stop by the nest and uh, we'll see you there, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thanks.